Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. I am Professor Dave Harbour. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science here at Victoria uh, University, and I, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Um, for those of you who are regular attendees, you may already know this, but we've hosted a number of talks this year um, that are designed to highlight a number of things that um, aren't unique to Victoria University, but are certainly things that we've been wanting to talk about. One of the things is the opportunity to highlight some of our fantastic researchers, and several of them are here tonight to talk to you. Um, I haven't had to twist their arms too hard. Um, it shows their enthusiasm for what they do. A second thing that underlies why we've been giving these talks this year around a range of topics is that they're all, how do I put it, hot topics um, that expand beyond science itself but into our community and um, they're important in a whole lot of ways. Um, and they also illustrate how researchers at Victoria are contributing to these hot topics um, in terms of new developments and our understanding. And also that these sorts of topics, the, the big things that are out there in the media at the moment around climate change, um, cures for cancer, you name it, they don't any longer require being addressed from just one discipline or just one researcher. We've, we've kind of moved past the era of a single person making that major discovery that changes the world. The big breakthroughs are coming through an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And so it even extends beyond researchers working together and organisations. And that's a nice segue into the fact that tonight is a really great opportunity for us to showcase a really deep, um, enduring engagement that Victoria University has with the Milligan Institute of Medical Research here, here on campus. Now, they're the New Zealand's foremost independent biomedical research institute, engaged in cutting-edge research around cancer, allergy, and gut health research. And so we have we brought together people who work across organisations, across disciplines, um, in the area of immunology, quite simply. So the topic of tonight's talk, you and your 10 billion best microbial buddies, how microbes shape the immune system, is the topic of tonight. And before I introduce our speakers, our two main speakers, I just wanted to sort of give a little bit of background about why we're touching on this topic. We've done talks this year around sustainable energy. People accept we, well, hopefully they accept, we need to engage in more sustainable energy practices. How do we engage around conservation, improving conservation efforts? Tonight's one is around immunology. So why? Why immunology? From my perspective, as I look across the scientific literature, immunology is a really breakthrough area. It goes beyond simply asking, how does our immune system deal with diseases, which is how a lot of us think about immunology. Immunology is a real breakthrough area. If I look at um, the internationally, I'm going to argue, the number one journal in, in, in science, called, ironically, Science, that, that journal in 2013 identified the top 10 breakthroughs in science that year. Not so long ago. And it's said that around immunology, um, one of the top 10 areas, that it was a major breakthrough area. And one of the examples, in fact, it was their top area of breakthrough in 2013, was, to quote them, the immunotherapy approach to cancer treatment i.e. harnessing people's own immune systems as a tool to combat cancer, is now the major clinical pro um, promise, or has the clinical promise, breakthrough in the last 60 years of, of cancer treatment. And that's something quite significant. We know cancer is an issue, it's a major area in which people want to be um, getting those breakthroughs, and immunology seem to be a key. Whether it stands up to that, we'll see what happens but it is currently a very hot topic. Another reason relates to, I guess, our values and our motivation as, as academics and researchers. And the people that I've got here tonight, um, the two main speakers and our three panelists, actually haven't taken much arm twisting because every academic or researcher that I engage with in my role, which makes my role really great, wants to communicate their science. And they want to engage with the public and tell people about what they're doing is so important. 
And so tonight is also an opportunity to show that to the general public. And it's really great that we can do that across two institutions, Victoria and Maligan. Okay, so the structure of tonight is in two main parts. We have two main speakers and then we have some panellists um, along for the second part. And maybe we'll have some question and answer that from the audience that flows on from that. So we sort of go from more formal to an informal part as we go through. Um, right now I want to introduce our two main speakers, then we'll have a quick break just while I introduce our panellists later on after we've had our two main speakers. Our first speaker is Professor Anne Laflamme from the School of uh, Biological Sciences here at Victoria University. Professor Laflamme um, completed her PhD at the University of Washington in 97 and following that she spent time working as a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University in New York before moving to New Zealand um, to join Victoria's School of Biological Sciences. Anne's research, or so she says on the internet, so I'll quote it, um, is in the areas of cellular immunology, immune regulation, disease processes, infectious diseases, and autoimmunity. A number of years ago, she became fascinated by how immune system can modify itself to accommodate chronic parasites. Um, and she wanted to know how it might deal with two things at once, effectively a parasite and a disease. That's what our immune system has to deal with. And this has been a feature of a lot of her work and will inform some of what she talks about tonight. Anne has a leadership role in the Multiple Sclerosis Program at the Maligan Institute of Medical Research, hence the connection, and is currently involved in a clinical trial at Wellington Hospital for secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And tonight she's going to explore the relationship we have between the larger microbes, worms as we think of them, and how despite they might be commonly perceived as something nasty, how they can actually be advantageous to improved health. Our second speaker is Dr Elizabeth Forbes Bloom from, as a team leader at the Maligan Institute of Medical Research here in Wellington. And Dr Forbes Bloom completed her PhD studies at the John Curtin School of Medical Research and Australian National University in Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Centre in the US. That's a very long sentence. Um, following this, she returned home to New Zealand with the purpose of building a research programme that takes an immunological approach to health and disease to move our understanding beyond local immune responses in the gut to encompass the in dynamic interplay between food, the immune, cellular networks and microbiota within. This is quite a dynamic approach to understanding the immune system. Elizabeth leads a team of immunologists with expertise in inflammatory and infectious diseases at the Maligan Institute of Technology, uh, sorry, Medical, Institute of Medical Research. She is also part of the high value nutrition science leadership team charged with providing better understanding for how food supports respiratory immune defense against infection and manages pollution driven inflammation. So in the second talk of tonight, Elizabeth is going to um, look into a little bit further how our immune system is shaped by microbes. So you've listened to me enough, and I'm going to hand over to Anne, who is going to kick off our talks. Great, well, welcome. Let's see. So today we are going to focus on how our perceived enemies become our friends. Yes, the friends that you can carry with you wherever you go. You don't have to buy an extra seat on the plane. No problem, they're with you. And so, while I'm gonna specifically talk about the larger ones, the first thing I really need to do is to t start to think and talk about how the immune system recognizes small microbes, large microbes, and to understand that relationship so that we can then understand how we could make that a good relationship. Okay. So the first thing is, what is our immune response? What gives us immunity? So in fact, the immune response really is built up of a series of individual cells. These cells form an army for you. And they're fascinating because they all come from the bone marrow. They get into the blood, they can circulate, they can move everywhere. They're very mobile. And by doing that, they can look around and recognize an enemy when an enemy presents itself. They can then act very quickly to contain and kill or neutralize that enemy. And in that process, like an army, 
They must think about how to minimize any damage that occurs, and when there is damage that occurs, how to then initiate af after an infection, after getting rid of the enemy, how to initiate repair. So repair is an incredibly important aspect of the immune system, and it's one of those things we probably didn't appreciate till more recently. Once there's rebuilding and cleanup, that army needs to maintain surveillance, and it needs to maintain that memory of the enemy so that it can act more quickly, also so that it can act in an appropriate manner. So it will change how it will react that second time so that it can do it more efficiently. So in that, we tend to think of ourselves in this golden box, this protective layer that keeps all of those nasty microbes that want to get into us at bay. Because we really need to appreciate that we are tasty. There are a lot of organisms that would like to share in our deliciousness. <laughs> and so we need to keep our resources to ourselves. We need to keep ourselves separate from that. And so we think of our immune system, oh, perfect, it creates that shell. But if the immune system falters, if it fails, then the microbes can get in and cause disease. When we do that, we really need to ask how good that barrier is and where that barrier exists. Because we tend to try to think that our whole environment needs to be sterile, so we run around with antimicrobial soaps and we clean and we scrub. Everything has to be sterile. But really, we're surrounded. These microbes are absolutely everywhere. But not every microbe necessarily wants to be your enemy. There are a lot of microbes around that are sharing our space. And they tend, they are outside of us. But what we sometimes don't remember is what is exactly the outside of us versus the inside. We think of the skin, skin is outside, but do you often remember that your gut is outside of you? And in fact, in your gut, there are a lot of microbes that are living and flourishing in your gut. But they aren't really invading into you, but they're in a space in which you are in constant communication. The other thing is, we have lived this way for a long, long time. We have lived, you individually have probably lived with some of those microbes since you were born. They've been there all the time. We have evolved as a species in close contact with other organisms. And what that means is that we have, that has shaped our relationship, how we respond to the different microbes, how they respond to us. In cases of disease, when a microbe is successfully penetrates our, <coughs> our precious barrier and invades, then you know some microbes have evolved ways to escape the immune system. Other times, they you know we get the upper hand and we can clear very quickly. But it is it's a dialogue that has created. And created. And that dialogue really is based upon the immune system recognizing something that is not part of you and then having to determine whether it is friend or foe. Okay. And to do that, that army can be broken up into soldiers that have different functions. And we could take one broad cut and say part of that army is part of what we call the innate immune system. And the innate immune system is a group of cells that will act very quickly. They will recognize broad patterns that are conserved, so it may recognize a wide range of bacteria. Not the individual species, but it might recognize a huge range of conserved patterns. Acts quickly, and it's also responsible for taking information to bring the adaptive immune system up. Now, the adaptive immune system is something that all vertebrates have, so there are a lot of us that have it, but it's this really unique and useful process by which we have cells that recognize very specific patterns, identify the individual. For example, a broad pattern may be you would recognize a cat, but a, 
an adaptive cell would know that cat is fluffy or that cat is Moses or whatever specific cat will be able to distinguish by doing that those cells have memory however to get to that precious memory takes a while it's a slow process and so you have the innate immune system controlling the fort while the adaptive system comes in so then on a precise level how does this happen well, if you imagine there are microbes that get past our barriers, the first cell, the innate cell, will pick up that there are microbes there. Many of them will try to control immediately, whereas some will take up evidence that that microbe is there, all of that information that says this is the type of microbe it is, and will bring it to the adaptive immune system. And one of the main adaptive immune cells is a T cell. So the information is passed along, and this T cell now must make a decision, a decision that's based on the information that the innate system has given to it. That decision then will decide what part of the army goes in to attack. Do you want those cells to go and kill infected cells? Do you want them to destroy microbes, repair tissue, produce antibodies? Or do you want the whole thing to just turn off? Is it time to shut down the immune system? That decision is critical in controlling the effects of an infection. And each microbe is going to initiate a slightly different response, one that you would hope would be appropriate for the type of microbe it is. So one thing to remember is I'm talking about this one microbe that just gets in. It turns out this process is happening all the time. It doesn't just happen when that microbe gets through our skin barrier. In fact, our immune system is continuously sampling from the outside, especially in the gut. It samples. And so we are continuously initiating a process where you have innate cells bringing information to T cells, and those T cells making decisions. And so that decision sets up an environment in which we need to work and all responses will be shaped by that environment. Now Liz is going to be talking about how the small microbes that you carry with you every day will shape that immune environment. I instead I'm going to talk about bigger things. I like to be able to look at things and poke around. I'm going to talk about the worms, the bigger ones. Okay. So now worms come in a variety of sizes and shapes. They live in different locations. Some live in the gut, like ascaris or tapeworms. Or you might find um, a kind of coccus, which used to be a huge problem here in New Zealand. You may find them in the tissues, such as Trichinella spiralis, or even in the blood, such as the filarial worms that cause elephantiasis, or even the schistosome worms here. Now, my previous work was looking at the schistosome, so you're going to get to know these lovely little worms quite well. So our question then is, are these friends or are they foe? Well, I would have told you in my PhD they were foes. We've got to get rid of them. But we're since thinking maybe they are a useful enemy. Not necessarily a friend, but a useful enemy. So when you think of how the immune system needs to deal with these large worms, it's in a different way than the small microbes, because the innate cells can't deal with big things. They can't kill them, contain them. So the immune system has to develop other mechanisms to deal with worms. And one of the primary things they do is that T cell makes the decision to repair tissue and to shut down the immune system. The idea is if you can't beat it, you live with it. And so a lot of worms cause chronic infections that our immune system just deals with. It deals with the consequence and tries to minimize damage. And that seems to be this mindset, just minimize damage, repair. So where do you find worms now? 
Well, if you look for where most of the worm infections are, they tend to be in the equatorial regions, tropical warm areas. Whereas a lot of the areas farther from the equator and those in developed countries tend to have very low worm infections. And as it turns out, the immune response that that worm induces is quite distinct from that which is induced by a lot of microbes. A lot of um, microbes causing it destroy, you know, that destroy microbes, kill cells, whereas the worms, you get that repair tissue, turn off the immune response. So initially, I had looked at that sort of dichotomy, how two infections can work. But I started working instead looking at a group of diseases that are found in a lot of the developed countries in very high frequency that are also driven by many of those same responses, an overactive kind of kill microbes and cells. And those are those chronic inflammatory or immune-driven diseases or autoimmune diseases, such as multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, atherosclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel diseases. There's a huge range, a huge list of these. And what I've shown here is the frequency of multiple sclerosis in the world. The darker the orange, the more frequent it is. And you can see it doesn't really occur in the equatorial regions. Whereas the green areas, or with this particular worm, the schistosome worms, um, are infecting people. And so there is this mutual exclusion of those. Now that could be due to many, many, many different things. And so our first question was to say, well, does this immune response that you get with the worms, which is turn off immune responses, repair, you know, tolerate yourself, will that help or will that protect you from diseases where the immune system is dysfunctional and is driving disease? So we did those first experiments where we used an experimental model to directly assess the effect of worms on the development of MS. And if you look at MS incidence, you can see that for those animals that had a worm infection, these schistosome worms, there was a delay in the onset and there was a <coughs> significant reduction in the incidence and the severity of disease compared to animals that did not have those worms. And if we looked at that type of immune response, what we had done is we had driven that repair tissue response. So these are animals that have worms and have this nice repair tissue response. And this particular marker is a good uh, indicator of that. And those animals that had worms but MS also had that. So they had less severe disease, significantly less. OK, this is an experimental model. What does that mean? Well, that was followed up years later, looking in people this is a group down in Argentina, uh, George Corrale, who had looked at people who became infected with parasitic worms, but after their first diagnosis of MS. So he followed them for five years. And he then divided those who remained uninfected versus those in blue who became infected with worms after being diagnosed with MS. And what you can see if you look at the number of episodes, or you look at the change in the disease severity score, you'll see there's a significant improvement in these people when they had, that had worms. <coughs> Not in this paper, but in a following paper, he showed that if you treated those patients with anti-helminthics to kill the worms, the disease would come back. So those worms were having an effect, direct effect, on the immune response, on that immune-driven disease. So that led people to think, well, let's go in or jump in and we'll use worms to treat MS. So this is from a good review by John Fleming's group, and he's running, been running trials looking at this. And you could see there are a range of observational or exploratory ones. And there have, and I will uh, tell you the bottom line is to date there aren't any conclusive results. Um, but I'll show you a little bit about the HINT-2 trial and then the WORMS trial. Those are two that are looking at the use of different worms in relapsing remitting MS. 
So you have to figure out what worm do you use? So I started with schistosomiasis because that's the worm that I was using and it's really good at altering immune responses. But schistosomiasis is a horrible disease and it does cause significant pathology. And you don't want to cause more harm than benefit. So you have to choose a worm that potentially will not cause harm or one that causes the minimal uh, pathology. So the two that have come up and seem to be the most frequently used are the hookworm, Necator americanus. Now hookworms will attach in the gut and the one that they have chosen is one that is not too greedy. So they like to attach to the gut and drink your blood. So not too greedy, so it doesn't drink too much. Yeah, okay. So the other one is the pig whipworm. So this worm is not uh, a natural pathogen of humans. It's a natural pathogen of pigs. So it, if you take the eggs and you eat them, they will hatch and the worm will try to establish an infection. But it's not made for, for humans, and so your immune system will clear this worm within two weeks. But during that process, it will induce a response, that repair tissue response, suppress the immune system response. That is what you want. So it does cause that transient effect. Okay. What they've also found is, in fact, you don't have to have necessarily a, a live worm that in fact for most worms, you can take either whole eggs that um, are just a source of foreign products basically, that cannot develop into adult worms, and you can show that they will inhibit disease. They will do the same thing. There's also a group, uh, this is a group from Don Harn's group, has been looking at different carbohydrates, the sugars that these worms have, which are very unique, and they alone can induce this sort of a response. So you may look at these and say, oh, no worms, no worms. But we can take parts of worms and try to find ones that will work as well. Okay, so then the question is, does this approach only work for MS? I focused on MS because that's my background. That is how we discovered this was a useful way to go. But in fact, there have been studies worldwide that have looked at the use of worms or worm products in a variety of situations. So there's been work by Ann Cook in Cambridge University looking in type 1 diabetes and showing in, this is an experimental model where mice naturally or naturally get diabetes and these are the black bars. Over time many become diabetic. Whereas if they were infected with these worms or given these eggs or even a soluble protein extract, they are protected. There's uh, evidence that it works quite well in inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's disease, inflammatory colitis, and I'll show you that evidence in just a moment. But there are also studies looking at the use in asthma, in allergy, rheumatoid arthritis, and even we looked in atherosclerosis to see whether there was any effect. So there are a variety of settings in which helmets or live helmets or helmet products may be useful. Really the, the success story out of all of those where the, the work is showing to be useful is in the inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And this is work by Joel Weinstock's group at the University of Iowa. And he was showing in ulcerative colitis using those pig whipworms that in fact after a 12-week treatment that there was a significant reduction in um, many of the parameters that and the effects of ulcerative colitis. And the big one you can see this is the percent of people that responded well, meaning that they had less disease. A similar thing was ha happened as well in Crohn's disease, again with this uh, pig whipworm. And Probably if you just focus on the upper graph, this is looking at the disease severity over time. And if you look at the little purple arrows, that is when that particular participant had a, had a dose of worms. So remember these worms last for about two weeks. And you can see 
that after one dose, the disease seemed to recede, got better. But eventually, that person cleared those worms and the disease came back. However, when given in a maintenance dose, so given every two weeks, that effectively um, caused the disease to go into remission. So again, I say the success really in worm therapy seems to be in the inflammatory bowel diseases. And in some ways that makes sense because it's in that location that the particular worms people have been using, especially uh, the pig whipworms, it's in that location where the disease is. In contrast, I think MS is always a bit of a hard one because you're trying to influence an immune response that's occurring in a very different part of the body. That's not to say it can't be done. We just haven't figured out how to do that quite yet. So in summary, the current state is we know that we can use full worms, we can use parts of worms, we can use even very specific sugars or um, unique uh, factors that you find in worms that can then change this interaction, the interaction in the immune system such that when the T cell makes a decision, it makes the decision to repair tissue, to turn off the immune system or at least dampen it down a bit with the idea that by doing that, it may be able to stop or um, reduce those responses which are driving a chronic inflammatory process. And that may be a process in lupus or asthma, type 1 diabetes, or inflammatory bowel disease. So we're looking at this as a process of potentially um, balancing an immune response that has gone awry. It is still just the start, and there are things that we have to be very cautious about, always thinking about weighing that risk versus the benefit. One thing that all of the studies have really shown is that the worms they've chosen are fairly well tolerated. However, one thing to note is not everyone is the same, and within a population there are still people who do not tolerate the worms very well. So we're still trying to understand who would be the best, uh, the best candidate for this sort of a therapy and to get it to work, to work well. We also know that while I've given this rash generalization about worms doing this, not every worm is protective. And there are certain situations in which the worms are not going to be protective. And certainly, there are some worms that you do not want to be infected with and they are best left in the enemy category. And finally, what the field really needs for a lot of the different applications are the robust clinical trials. And a lot of those trials take a lot of time, they take a lot of money, and they take a lot of support from people that are willing to participate in them. So there are three very difficult things to get all at the same time. Okay, so I always have to acknowledge that there have been a lot of people that have come through my lab and they have all worked on various aspects of how the immune system learns to control itself. And while I talk about work that I've done, it's really work that they've done, I have to say. And of course, I wouldn't be anywhere without my family. You are sitting off in the corner. Thank you. Now, I, before you say anything, we're not going to have time for questions now because we will do those questions within the panel time. Okay, and then we can all join in and have a really good discussion. Thank you. I now get to champion the little guys, your gut microbiota. These are things that we've really only just recently come to understand how important they are for our health and how the ways things have changed over the past century may change our gut microbiota and predispose to disease. I want to be clear though, what I am saying is that the gut microbiota is not the cure to all that ails us. If it was that simple, my colleagues and I would hang up our lab coats, go have a beer because our jobs would be done. What I would say though, and what I would posit that my gut immunology team and I believe, 
is that they are an important part of the puzzle and that we need to consider them when we're looking for solutions for the treatment and prevention of disease. As late as the 19th century, we still believed in miasma, that disease travelled on foulsome air. And we will have all seen the pictures of the Medico della Peste or the Plague Doctor, dressed as pictured here with the famous Plague Doctor's mask. And it has this beak-like structure to the mask because we believed that disease travelled on the air and therefore we had to ward off said foulsome air. This beak was filled with rose petals and vinegars to ward off the disease. And then these two fellows came along, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, whose research identified that the germ theory, that specific microbes or specific germs were responsible for specific diseases. From here, immunology was born. Then came Edward Jenner at around the same time what Edward Jenner did was he invented vaccination. <coughs> so there was a long-held belief and a lot of evidence to suggest milkmaids that had had cowpox were immune from getting smallpox. And so Edward Jenner took some of the pus out of a cowpox lesion and used it to create a vaccine. And what he showed was that was able to provide protective immunity against smallpox. And in 1979, the World Health Organization declared smallpox eradicated because of vaccination. And if we look at this figure here, all I want to show you is, on the left-hand side, you can see all of that red, and that indicates the number of deaths in the US pre-vaccine era. And on the right, you can see that we've got rid of most of the red, showing that vaccination has had a powerful effect on infectious disease. Smallpox remains the only thing that's been eradicated, although polio, you can see here, has 100% in the US. That is not the case all over the world. Nonetheless, vaccination, together with improved hygiene practices and antibiotic use, has significantly reduced the death and the burden of infectious disease around the world. However, at the same time, we have seen this massive rise in these so-called chronic inflammatory diseases that Anne introduced. Asthma, diabetes, obesity, cancer, to name a few. Is there some sort of a connection? And could our gut microbes be part of the key? And I think the key point is that we had this fascination or this focus that microbes were bad that they were pathogens that we had to seek out and kill. And so for too long, immunologists ignored, at our peril, the gut microbiota as potentially being our friends. And this is one of the key ways that I like to illustrate this. Even now, many of my colleagues will still call them commensal gut microbiota. Yet the definition of commensal is when only one of the partners is benefiting. If, our, if this was the case, it would be the commensals that were benefiting, and we're simply there to host them. They live in us, they eat from us, and we gain no benefit from them at all. But we now know, in fact, this is not the case, that it is a symbiotic relationship, that not only do they get a house and food, but we also benefit significantly from them because they educate our immune system and teach us to be healthy. And this is bringing together a lot of the ideas that Anne presented, and an idea that's been around since the 80s, which has been coined the hygiene hypothesis. That idea that we've created sterility, that we use antibacterials, that we use many more antibiotics than we used to. And maybe removing all of these things means that we're not educating our immune system appropriately, and the unintended consequences of this is the development of allergy, <coughs> cancer, diabetes, obesity, MS, and so on. So what I want to posit to you tonight is an extension of the hygiene hypothesis, that of the microbiota hypothesis. And so this brings back that friend or foe thing, because we're not quite sure exactly where we stand and we've still got a lot of work to do. However, the hypothesis itself would predict that an unhealthy gut microbiota can contribute to these inflammatory diseases like obesity, and diabetes, and allergy. 
but that if we have a healthy gut microbiota, it may be able to prevent the development or perhaps even treat existing disease. And one of the key points of life for this is right at the start, just when we're being born, because that's when the relationship of our gut microbiota and our immune system is just being established. Both of these things are growing, learning and educating, and those two things combined are really important. And so we would say that these interactions could present a series of mechanisms that essentially tell your immune system how to be fit leading to lifelong health and to adulthood and beyond. And if we think about the gut microbiota and its trajectory over time, this is essentially what it looks like. So up here you have the stability of the microbiota, and along here we have the life trajectory. So when we're first born, you can see that we start to acquire our microbes, and over this time it's a really unstable environment. Anything that we do that could impact this may have long-term consequences. Then around the age of three to five, we get our stable microbiota, and that's pretty much what it can look like throughout our life in adulthood. We can take antibiotics and it'll take a hit, but it'll bounce back. However, we could also have an inflammatory disease, like inflammatory bowel disease or obesity, and we will see changes in those gut microbiota that may create a new normal for us throughout the rest of our life. And then as we age, we have more changes in our diet, changes in the way we live, and changes in our immune system, which can impact what our gut microbiota look like and can impact that stability and diversity in our elderly. So if we think about it, the gut microbiota and their composition is really important in our most vulnerable populations early in life in infants, and in our elderly as well. So what I've attempted to present to you today is this really complex interplay between the immune system and the microbiota, and that these things cannot be considered in isolation, that they both impact each other, and because of this dual way that they talk, it makes it really, really hard to understand how it's all happening, because one thing can happen that'll impact another thing, and you have the snowball effect. So how do we work out what's most important to target to keep us healthy? And beyond that, we then throw in a whole bunch of environmental differences, like diet, stress, antibiotic use, that can change up the whole system again. And I guess my key point is, it's really, really hard to work out. We're still trying to get there but I'll try and give you a couple of examples as to why I think the gut microbiota are really important. The first is using germ-free mice. So these are mice that lack gut microbiota, and if we look at their immune system, here we're looking at the different parts of the army, and you can see stained up in purple here and in a reddy brown here. These are mice that lack gut microbiota, these are mice that have them. And you can clearly see that there's more of the army stained up in the bottom panels than there is in the mice that lack microbiota. Your microbiota educates your immune system, it tells it to grow, it tells it what its purpose is, and so if you don't have them, your immune system doesn't function properly. These mice are more disposed to getting allergy, and they are more susceptible to infectious disease as well. So that's pictured here. These are germ-free mice that have ended up with anaphylaxis, so they've had food allergy, they've got anaphylaxis, and you can see the temperature drop, which means they're going into shock, depicted here. And over here, again, we're looking at our germ-free mice. They've been given the seasonal flu vaccine, and they don't make protective antibody responses like their friends that have gut microbiota. Gut microbiota require what we eat for food and gut microbiota eat fiber that we feed them, and they produce metabolites that can impact our immunity. So what we're looking at here is a table showing the difference between individuals who have a really low, high, uh, low fiber diet compared to individuals who have a high fiber diet. And what you can see is that, in essence, you are twice, almost twice as likely to die if you eat a low fiber diet than a high fiber <coughs> diet, and most strikingly, 
That's independent of whether you're a smoker or you have a high BMI. Your high fibre diet seems to be, from this study, more important. And if we think about some of our 21st century diets, high fat, high sugar, low fibre, we might start to understand why we've gotten ourselves into a little bit of trouble. But I also want to point out that this is not a new concept at all. Back in the early 1900s, Eli Mishnikoff, who's widely touted as a forefather of probiotics, said that the dependence of intestinal microbes on food makes it possible to adopt measures to modify the flora in our bodies and replace the harmful microbes with useful ones. And over a century has passed and we're still trying to work out what's going on because of this really complex interplay. We've started to answer some of the questions that we've asked and we're starting to get close on how we might be able to find beneficial microbes to improve our immune system. So here, all I would like to highlight <coughs> is a large number of diseases. You'll be hearing about new ones every week that have been associated with changes in your gut microbiota. These are changes that have been seen in diseased individuals. So what we don't yet know is that cause and consequence. Did they develop that disease or did they have an increased risk of developing that disease because they had changed gut microbiota? or because they developed an inflammatory disease and the immune system can impact back on their gut microbiota, did that cause the changes? We need to answer some of those questions, find out who the good guys are, and start looking to see if we can find microbial ways of treating or potentially preventing these types of diseases. But it's not just these 21st century diseases, these new diseases. Your gut microbiota also seem to play an important role in your immunity to the pathogens, the infectious diseases as well. And so here we have a list of the bad guys. And if we alter our gut microbiota, we alter the protective immunity that that immune army can come and seek out and kill those guys. So I'd just like to take a minute to talk about some of the current thinking in our team at the moment. And where this really comes from is this is our model system. We control our experimental systems very exquisitely because if they're exposed to an infection or there's a change in their diet or their environment is altered, it can alter their immune system and it can alter their gut microbiota. So we've created this really reductionist approach so that we know we're comparing apples with apples. But in doing so, We've almost created that box around our experimental model, like Anne suggested. We've taken out a lot of the factors that we think are important in impacting our immune system. So you can see these boxes here, and they're all split up into quadrants. They're split by four. And if I asked you to look at the top row and then look at the bottom row and compare those three things, you're likely to say two of these things look more like one themselves than the other. And does anybody want to tell me which one's the odd one out? Come on. <laughs> Come on, Ed. <laughs> Could it be this one? So these two look more, remarkably more similar in where they sit in those quadrants than these two, right? Our lab mice look more like our neonatal humans compared to the adults that we're actually trying to model. And we think that this is likely because our lab mice, just like a newborn, haven't had a chance to be exposed to those infections and environmental conditioning that could alter their immune system, like all of the adults will have seen. So is our model system really what we're trying to model at all? And these researchers have also shown that this has to do with that environmental exposure. So here we're looking at the lab mice, wild mice, and pet store mice. And you can see, again, our lab mice are the odd ones out. The animals that have been exposed to external environment clearly have differences in their immune system. But the really cool thing, in my opinion, is we can take our lab mice, house them with either wild mice or pet store furry little friends, they can pass on those gut microbes and those infections and 
train their immune system just like the outside world. So we can still keep control of several of the critical factors. We know their genetic history, so we know that that's not playing a role. We can control their diet, their environment, all the other factors. We're just changing their microbes and we can now have an immune system that may potentially look more like the human condition and start to ask some even more complicated questions. So I would just like to leave you with this slide. You are not alone. You are an ecosystem. We say approximately 100 trillion, and of course we've told you this evening that some of those are bad guys, so probably about 10 billion are the really good ones. We have to consider ourselves as an ecosystem, treat this as a whole entity, understand these really complicated interactions, and try and find a way to put all that information together to treat and prevent not only these chronic inflammatory diseases, but support our immune system against pathogenic ones as well. So thank you very much. So let's move on to part two. I'm going to take the opportunity just to, because I think it's absolutely fascinating because I really love the point at which Elizabeth finished in terms of think of yourself as an ecosystem. Um, because that really brings home the message here. And I mean, I was making notes to myself in terms of what we're talking about tonight, although there's this focus on the immune system, it touches on to neurological disorders, it touches on to, to bowel, gut issues, it touches on to allergies. There's actually such a broad aspect to how understanding the interaction between the immune system, the genetics, the way we've evolved, everything, or actually, interplays with understanding disease and this is why I really wanted us to do this talk tonight is that I th really think this is quite a, a breakthrough area in our way of understanding the treatment of disease, understanding human conditions that possibly we're only just sort of really getting to grips with these days and it really challenges some of our understanding. I mean every time I, I sort of hear and talk I keep thinking about you know you're going to get past the fact that worms could be good for you, kind of reminds me of leeches but there's a sense to which it kind of makes sense. Um, and so th there's a lot here, and I think it is really exciting territory. But our next task is sort of part two, is, is to bring in um, three other people who will bring up the front, and uh, when they're feeling brave, they can stand up. Um, I have no idea what people are going to say tonight. This is very much a sort of an open discussion. And what we want to do is expand things a little bit. So we've got our two main speakers, but we've got some other specialists along tonight who also can broaden, you know, the discussion that we're touching on. So firstly, we've got uh, Joanna McKitchen. Um, there we go. She put her hand up. Joanna is a senior lecturer in microbiology and biological sciences here at Victoria. The focus of her research is on host pathogen interactions, specifically studying how pathogens overcome host defenses to cause disease. Her work is focused on various pathogens, inclu including probably most of our friend, Campylobacter, not really a friend, and the bacteria that cause stomach ulcers, meningitis, and catch scratch disease. I've never heard it called that, but I think many of us know exactly what that is if you've owned a cat. Um, Dr. Jeremy Owen, there we go. Um, also at Victoria University, Jeremy's um, in the biochemistry area here in biological sciences at Victoria. He studies natural products produced by soil bacteria, so a different perspective again, and is particularly interested in compounds that have the potential to be developed into new antibiotics. So again, a different perspective on how we deal with disease. And Jeremy's laboratory at Victoria uses DNA sequencing and, sequencing and synthetic biology to isolate new microbial um, natural products from soil bacteria that can't be cultivated in the laboratory. And then finally, by process of elimination, Dr. Lisa um, Connor, who holds uh, a position at Victoria and at Maligan. Lisa is a research fellow in immune, bio immune cell biology group at Maligan Institute of Medical Research and a lecturer in immunology at Victoria. She gained her PhD at the Maligan Institute in 2010 after investigating the immune response to vaccination against tuberculosis. Following this, she took up a postdoctoral position at the Trudeau Institute in New York State to work on vaccine response, responses to influenza. And since returning to New Zealand in 2012, her current research is to understand how immune responses are responsible for allergic diseases um, and how they can be initiated. So quite a broad sort of 
perspective of expertise around immunology. Um, what I might do is sort of throw over to Anne to maybe choreograph um, some statements, thoughts, broadening, and then maybe some questions from the audience. So I thought, since you've heard Liz and I talk, you have a good idea of our background. But I thought just to remind you of what our panelists are doing, <laughs> I will first start and say what, what Dave didn't say was Lisa has done some and published some really lovely, elegant work on worms. She is what we call a worm lover. <laughs> okay. Jeremy, yeah, I think Dave touched upon it. He looks at microbes as a feast, something to harvest and use. He is a microbe user. And Joanna, well, <laughs> Joanna is interested in that host pathogen interaction. And so we call her an expert in bad relationships. <laughs> 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 now, can you see us all? Oh, good. Now, it would be great if there are questions from you to start that way. We can always talk amongst ourselves. We can always pull pranks. We're very good at that. But if there are any questions, you can ask any of us. Yes. I don't know that anyone has done anything on threadworm or pinworm, which it's also called there. Yes, so most of us will, will know of it. We might have had children that had it. Um, no one's really looked at it, and it may be because of the location and the life cycle. It doesn't end up being um, kind of initiating as strong a response as you'd expect, but no one's really looked at that. They've looked at other ones that are probably deeper into the gut that have a better um, relationship with the immune system. But I can look into that if you're interested, but I haven't heard of any. I have a question. Mother had a question. Uh, I'm gonna, we have one hand here, and then we're going to come right back to you. So that's a possibility to some extent. Now, there are some worms that directly turn off the immune system, such as the filarial worms, will turn off the immune system such that in elephantiasis, a lot of the scarring and the problems are due to secondary bacterial infections because the immune system is not able to control that infection as well. Okay. A lot of the responses when I say it's stop, most of it's dampening down, so it's initiating that response. Um, I did a, a study a few years ago when I was looking at that interaction. I was actually looking at two different parasites, one which requires the immune system to have that kill microbe to kill it off. It's called leishmania. It causes uh, more localized lesions. And in fact, what you found is the immune system was still able to control that disease, but it took a little bit longer. It wasn't quite as efficient, but the end result was the same. So there is a potential impact, a negative impact with these. So it's important to, to realize, yeah, when you do balance, you balance everything. I guess too with that, there's like also an association with um, vaccine efficacy in, um, in areas where there's a high prevalence of worms. So, for example, the BCG vaccine, which is important for protecting against TB, it's not as effective in um, areas where you have a high burden of um, parasite infections. I'm going to take away that worm on the side. Uh, timing of exposure to 
Does anyone else want to answer this one? I'm going to. I can take it. Oh, we'll let Liz take this. She's been silent. Oh, I have a theory on the evolution because the first species that we can identify the adaptive immune system in is jawed fish. So I would argue that by allowing the ability to eat more solid food, you can then cause injuries to your intestinal tract. You can also generate the ability to have that gut microbiota and there came along the adaptive immune system because essentially through that evolution we needed another series of, of part of that army to control those new insults. Does that answer your question? Was it about the evolution or in an individual the development? It, it was to follow on to, to uh, ask if, the, if an individual ex exposure to, to uh, microbes during development if there is a, if there is a legacy in adulthood uh, by the timing of exposure during the development and training of the immune system. Yes, so the innate immune system, basically when you're born you have an innate immune system all ready to go. And that innate immune system is replenished throughout life. So there you're continuously pulling cells from the bone marrow and replacing that, that army. The adaptive immune system develops when you're born, basically. It's during that very, those very early months that your adaptive cells start to develop. That's when you're vulnerable. Uh, some of those cells produce antibody, which is why the antibodies transferred in mother's milk are so important, the, because they can cover and protect the child at that point. But you could imagine if this is the point in which your adaptive system is developing and is being shaped, this is also coincides with the point at which the child is experiencing the environment. The baby is there, has microbes from the mother, that's gotten from the mother and from the environment. But they are growing up together at this point. Do you want to add any yeah, more? So I would, I would say your thinking is, is dead on, that as the immune system develops, it's seeing things. And so if it's instructed, for example, to be tolerant to peanut, you may grow up and not develop peanut allergy. However, if your immune system's not educated or trained in the right way, you may have the unintended consequence of your immune system thinking that peanut is like a pathogen, and so your immune system reacts in the wrong way and you end up with peanut allergy. There's multiple pathways. So the microbes can have conversations in a way with the immune system directly because the immune system can sense those microbes and sense things on the outside of those microbes that can educate the immune system. The microbes can also make metabolites themselves that then impact the immune system. Um, and then that can go the other way. If you've got the good guys, they're doing that and they're telling your immune system to be tolerant of things like allergens and training it to be good at killing pathogens. But on the flip side, if you don't have the right gut microbiota or you end up with some bad guys because you've got an imbalance in your gut microbiota, then they can badly impact your immune system by activating it to cause inflammation. Does that answer your The pathogens have more things on them that tell our immune system that they're pathogens, but I'm going to hand it over to the, to the, yes. the bad relationship <laughs> experts. <laughs> <laughs> but from an immune point of view, it's, it, it's, they have different things on them that say they're bad. So for example, uh, Helicobacter expresses a molecule that's kind of a bad guy, but it doesn't activate the immune system to the same level as Salmonella which is a really, really bad guy. So based on sort of molecules that are on the outside of those mm -hmm. pathogens, it's, it's one of the ways our immune system senses them. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that um, the, immune, uh, you know, the immune system is a selective pressure acting on pathogens as well. So from the pathogens perspective, they don't necessarily want to trigger a, a, a 
food um, immune response. And so over time, you know, they've adapted by sort of either evading the immune response or um, in, some time, in some cases shutting it down. And so, um, but also, you know, they make toxins, for example, that, that cause a lot of damage. I think that the, you know, sensing the damage mm -hmm. can be part of starting that immune response. And we're kind of just starting to illuminate this whole thing, right? So we've got a really, really complex system of thousands of different organisms that are talking to each other by various mechanisms. And each one of those individual mechanisms is very difficult to participate on. So I've been looking at the whole interplay of them together, which is why this is such an exciting area. And there are definitely examples where people have seen, for example, a small molecule that's produced by bacteria that might activate a receptor on a human cell, or a bacteria that produces an antibiotic that kills other bacteria. Toxin or a genotoxin that will damage DNA and increase incidences of um, cholera or cancer, for example. So these things <coughs> are started to be sort of started to be elucidated on an individual basis. I think as over the coming years, we really start to see this really complex and uh, com complex mixture and the linkages between individual components start to start to come together. If I, I could also add, actually, the other thing to remember is that a lot of what is going to distinguish those which are pathogenic causing disease versus not is behavior. Those that are going to, that are causing disease are trying to invade, trying to get in. Those that are <coughs> mutualistic or th that are normally there are living within that niche and adapted to that niche. They may not necessarily be producing those toxins mm -hmm. to get in or having those, those mechanisms. So behavior is just as important as appearance and sometimes probably more. <laughs> And, and our immune system is right there on, under that barrier waiting for these invasive pathogens to come in. And so as soon as they see an invas invading pathogen, then they're going to act very quickly to start activating and getting that inflammation response going. Okay. We had a question here. We also had one here. And then there. We'll start in direction. <laughs> Sorry. We can move forward. So they provide the evidence because they provide the info, you know, the, I'm the boss, I need the info, that's the T cell. Now the T cell is adaptive, so it can recognize that specific information and interpret what is the problem. The macrophage is the innate system, okay, so it doesn't know what it has. Half the time what it brings is garbage, it, it doesn't mean anything, it's for the T cell. Mm -hmm. That's a million dollar question right there. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, you know, to be discovered. Uh, I just to see whether At this point, there's no definitive answer. But remember, I talked about two cells talking. But they're not talking in isolation. There's a huge environment around that, that is shaped by all the other immune cells, that is shaped by your own physiology. And so that environment can shape that interaction dramatically. And so in autoimmunity, that interaction can go wrong because the environment is, is wrong. And there are a range, and we can talk afterwards, it'd be great. I love talking about macrophages. <laughs> we had a question here.
So I think there's promise in functional foods like yogurts and probiotic yogurts to support our health, but I don't think we definitively have enough evidence to say that specific yogurt can, is the cure of all our ails. But I think these types of foods impacting our gut microbiota and being able to deliver other good bacteria are going to be an important part of the solution. And that perhaps we need to consider the merging together of sort of our more pharmacological agents and nutrition as a good approach to health and wellness in the future. Yes. <laughs> we currently have an exploratory study looking at the association of gut microbiota types and your immune response to the flu vaccine. Uh, as far as we're aware, and I'll look to the team members and they can tell me whether I'm wrong or not, there's no evidence that vaccination or sort of the flu vaccine per se is going to impact your microbiota. Uh, but what we want to see is whether or not different types of microbiota support a really good Im a protective immunity from the vaccine. Sure, because we jam our kids as their immune system is uh, developing. Well, no, actually by that time we usually pick it at times and it's really well set. Um, I will say, remember vaccination is targeted. Mm -hmm. And that is why you wouldn't necessarily interrupt or disrupt yeah. your natural flora because it's targeted, it's very specific which is why it has shown to have such a fantastic effect. And you saw Liz has a beautiful slide. I mean, as far as deaths due to those diseases, it's really gone. It's, it's beautiful. Yes. Probably all of us are going to contribute to this. Cause it, just know that the term inflammation is very broad and was described, in fact, was it 400, 600 BC by Celsius, in fact, it went through and said there are four cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, swelling, heat, and pain. And you think about it, you think about that, you, you, you feel those, you know those. Those are the sign that something is wrong. So inflammation is a sign and usually that sign is because your blood uh, the blood flow is changed to that area such as you get more blood cells in there with the white blood cells or the, the immune cells coming out you get fluid into that area along with that transgression you have more blood flow so you get heat and you have that pain the receptors uh, are increased so that you then take care of that area you know there's a problem so we use that as a very general term, but then that process applies to a lot of different things. Do you want to take the next one or you can pass along? Anybody else can go first? I can go. I guess the way I think about inflammation is you have inflammation that's there to control the, the environment, so whether that's a cut and you need to control the bacteria or you need to do wound repair or those types of things. And then there's the inflammation that we think of that's probably not quite so good when we think of inflammatory diseases. And the way I think about it is essentially the immune system gets it wrong. So, and for reasons we don't understand in susceptible individuals who have allergy, the immune system thinks house dust mite or peanut is a bad guy and it mounts an immune response to it instead of just tolerating it. Same thing with autoimmune disease. As the gentleman just mentioned, unfortunately our immune system thinks that self, so our joints or the neurons in our brain, are bad guys and they attack them. Um, does that help? Cool. Yes, sorry. It is true. I think this is definitely a Joanna one. 
the um, bad relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think over time, um, you know, a lot of times maybe we are exposed to a new pathogen that, you know, we previously have never seen, and there's been no opportunity for that, you know, mutual adaptation to take place that over time will attenuate pathogens. So, you know, say we're exposed to, you know, a new species of bat that previously we were never in any kind of contact with. Those bats are carrying their own microflora that probably don't make them sick, but they have the potential to make us very sick. And, you know, similar with, with like, for example, Campylobacter. You know, Campylobacter is basically part of the microflora of birds. So chickens have it, wild birds carry it. It doesn't really harm the birds at all, but because it has not co-evolved as our you know, it's having a relationship with us or, um, you know, sort of stably interacting with us, it can cause disease. And it's really sort of an accident from the perspective of the pathogen. Um, so it's, it's often, you know, the introduction of new pathogens that we've never seen before or that have never encountered us before. Probably other reasons as well, but sometimes, sometimes making the host sick is, is important for transmission. Mm -hmm. So True. making, you know, causing diarrhea or making the, the host cough and sneeze. All of that helps with transmitting and finding new hosts. Sometimes killing the host is good for the pathogen. For example, um, with plague, because it's carried by fleas, you know, by, by killing the, the mammalian host, those fleas disperse, they find new hosts, and the pathogen is carried along with them. So it often has to do with sort of how the pathogen is transmitted and what its natural reservoir host is. Okay. We had a question here. So what we have is association data, and that is that children born by caesarean <coughs> section are more likely or more at risk of developing diseases like allergic disease. Does that mean if you were born by caesarean section you will go on and get allergy? No. And does that mean if you were born naturally you're automatically protected from getting allergy? The answer to that one is also no. But what we do definitively know is the gut microbiota of infants born naturally versus caesarean section is very different. So when you're born naturally, you pick up the flora in the birth canal and also some of the gut microbiota, and that's your sort of seeding population that starts the whole party off, so to speak. In caesarean section born children, what we now know is that the gut microbiota is more similar to skin microbiota because they come out of that sterile environment and that's essentially the, the first microbes that they see. They take host in an empty house and start the party. You put, make a very beautiful point of if we can figure out who the good guys are, we have a solution to be able to get the microbiome <coughs> right at the start of life, and whether that caesarean section or not remains to be seen. But the point is, if we can find out what they are, we could then seed the child with the good guys and maybe reduce some of that increased susceptibility uh, shown with caesarean section. And there's some wonderful studies going on in both the US and Brazil looking at if you expose children to the flora from the birth canal, so they're the first ones, not the skin bacteria. What does that mean? So I think we're getting close. Okay. So I think we probably have time for one. I think there were two hands. So those two last questions, if that's all right. Dave, I'm going to completely ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> That was sort of where we started off, is what does healthy look like versus what does disease look like? And from healthy, can we work out the way forward to make the right type of microbiota? 
And when we started with that, we thought that there would be a large core of microbes that would be the same in everyone, and there'd be a few that would be different, and so that way it would be relatively easy to work out what's going on. Turns out, just as I can probably not describe to you what healthy is, it's very difficult to work out what a healthy microbiota is because just how we're all different, our gut microbiota is different too. So I think it's still a core principle of what we're trying to do, but it's more difficult than we first imagined. Okay, and I think our last question. Jeremy, yeah, Joanna, <laughs> <laughs> you're the micro <laughs> That's a really, that's a really good question. I mean, we're all sort of aware of the fact that oftentimes we'll come down with a virus, and then just as we're recovering from that, we'll get a secondary infection caused by a bacteria. That's a very common scenario. So, how are those two microbes, the virus and the bacteria, interacting, and how is the virus setting the stage for this bacteria to come in and, and take advantage of? you know, the, the weekend host. And that's a, a really, really important um, area of research. But, you know, we've always taken the sort of reductive approach of one pathogen on our, you know, specific pathogen free mice or, or whatever. So now we're starting to ask those maybe more complex questions, putting in another, you know, putting another player in and trying to see how those pathogens interact. Because obviously, co-infections are very, very common in the real world. And people are, you know, maybe not just infected with one thing, but maybe worms and, and, you know, malaria or, you know, so um, that's, that's really an area of research right now. I think we do a lot more answer than that. And I guess just like every ecosystem, they're all competing for space and resources. And so um, there's kind of like apex predators who can have yeah. more ability to control who's around. And for example, <coughs> as Jeremy mentioned, there's bacteria that can actually make their own antibiotics, kill off their neighbours and create space for themselves and those types of things. So it's complicated, and yes, they, they all play their part. And this is sort of one of the things we're struggling with because of the way things interact. We can't, you know, they're not separate entities, and we have to try and work out what's going on with all of those things together. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for all of your questions. Um, I love talking, as you might have figured out. Uh, and I know that my email is, is quite widely available and you're always welcome to ask questions, email me and probably I can say you could probably ask questions of anyone here and they would love to talk to you. So thank you. Thank you.